And if you look at our population of, and I encourage people to go on the internet and you can see a chart of what's happened in the last hundred years as far as the jail population, it's just gone up like this. There's two things that really impacted that. And they both started, the first one started in about 1955 or right in that era. When we as a society said, you know, it's not right to have people under lock and key for mental problems. So we started closing down those mental places, mental health facilities. Where do those people end up? They end up in prison. Welcome to episode 57 of People Are the Answer. I truly believe that people are the only answer to the world's many problems. I'm Jeffrey M. Zucker, a serial entrepreneur, here to learn how innovators are creating outsized transformational social impact. Today's episode features Roger Belair, a former banker and investor who is now a pickleball advocate and instructor who's been teaching the game in prisons, where it has shown to decrease violence and improve inmate communication while offering a great engaging activity. Roger and I discuss his career through banking and writing financial books and how that took him to bring pickleball to prisons. Here is Roger Belair on People Are the Answer. Roger, thank you so much for joining me on People Are the Answer. Jeff, it's great to be here. I've done some research and I'm impressed with what you're doing. I really appreciate that and definitely an honor to have you here. It'd be great if you could just start off by telling the audience, uh, you know, who you are, where you're based and what your current role is. Well, my background's in finance. And years ago, I was in banking and my position with a bank, I knew I wasn't going to achieve a, a fair amount of uh, financial success. So I, I started a little business on the side and it worked out. And we were very fortunate, right place at the right time. And I ended up being part of a cover story for Money Magazine. <laughs> well, th those type of things um, just change lives. One of the phone calls I got was from Doubleday out in New York. And they said, have you ever thought about writing a book? Well, my very first reaction was, I don't even write my mother. But my second thought was, you know, if some of these athletes can do it. I can always get help if needed. And I sat down with what was called a typewriter and started plucking away. And all of a sudden the manuscript looked pretty good. And so it sold real well. And then that led to a second book. I was asked to write on how to borrow money from a banker. So many entrepreneurs, they need some money, but they don't know exactly how to approach a bank. And so I wrote that book. It sold quite well. And then a friend of mine, you might recognize the name. His name is Vince Lombardi, Jr. Vince said, Roger, you know, you got a real unique niche here with the banking book. And there's a real demand for that. Let me introduce you to my agent. And, and I think you might want to, you know, give a few speeches. So I did that for a while. And I, I found out it was a lot easier to find a new audience and a new speech. And it was great to help some people. And... So I did that for a few years, and what paid the bills really was this investment company that I created. So that, that's, that's my background outside of what we're going to talk about today. Awesome. Yeah, thank you for sharing. And uh, where are you currently based? I'm outside of the Seattle area. I, just, I live just a little bit north of Seattle, and then when the rains come up here, I head south to Southern California and live in the Palm Springs area. And in life in general, what would you say motivates you? I would say either doing the deal having a vision and being able to accomplish it. That's by far a motivator for me. I'm not driven in the sense of buying new toys or trying to have something to impress somebody else. It's, it's doing something that can move the needle. Uh, early in my career, a lot of it was just gaining a certain amount of financial success, but uh, for security because money can buy options. But these days I'm a lot more into service and you can't change the world, but maybe we can do a few things to make it a better place. Yeah, I mean, to me, that's changing the world. Just one thing even to, to make it a little bit better. So I definitely appreciate that dedication to that. And um, you, know, you mentioned being in the Seattle area. Is that where you grew up? Or if not, where'd you grow up? I grew up in eastern Washington. And um, but after I got out of school and went to college, uh, I didn't want to live there. I wanted to move to the big city where all the girls are. So I ended up uh, you know, coming over here to Seattle. And I know you early on after school, you went and, and got your MBA at University of Idaho. 
Right. Yeah. And so what was education like for you? Is that just something you felt you had to do or are you one of those people that, you know, love school? Oh, no, I wasn't a very good student. And, um, you know, I struggled in school. I got my undergraduate degree, which surprised uh, some family members. And then um, Vietnam was really big at that time. And I thought I was going to be drafted, but I found out I had flat feet and I can't march. So I said, well, maybe I'll try to get into graduate school. And I did. Uh, I was never a very good student. And, you know, in the academic community, I've learned as the years go by, there's a certain way that they measure intelligence, IQ tests, you know, how you, how you, well you do on school as far as getting information, regurgitating that. I'm just kind of not made that way. I'm probably more of a right brain, creative type person that is more of a business person because once I got out in the business world, then it was easy for me. I just kind of followed my instincts. Once you, you got that degree, you spent some time in banking, you mentioned the firm that you started. And so talk, talk a little bit more about you know, how you spent, um, I believe it was 38 years at Bel Air and Briney. Well, you've done your homework. Absolutely. One of the things, uh, and I don't mean to get a little technical here, but I really need to in order to explain it. As a banker, back in the, in the 70s, it was common for a buyer and seller on real estate to reach a financial agreement where instead of going to the bank to borrow money, what they would do is they'd sit down and the buyer would say, all right, I'll give you so much down and I'll give you so much a month and you'll be earning your seven or eight percent, whatever it happens to be. And it was called private mortgages. And, and, you know, that's fine. But sometimes a seller after a year or two of collecting these monthly payments, they say, well, I don't want that thousand dollars a month. I want a lump sum cash because we're getting a divorce, want to go to Europe, whatever. And I figured out that that market was very, very thin. In other words, who does that person who's collecting the monthly payments go to to sell that asset? It, and because the, the market was so thin, I, I said, I'm going to go out and maybe what I'll do is I'll offer 60 cents, 70 cents on the dollar. Well, much to my pleasure, the first person I offered that to accepted it. It was a very small obligation note of $10,000. I offered $5,000. The face amount was 7%, and all of a sudden, I'm making 14%. Well, that worked, so I did it again and again and again. And the book I came out with for Doubleday was the first hardback book, and it was titled How to Make a Fortune or make a fortune buying discount mortgages. Got it. That, that's it's pretty cool to hear about, you know, this sort of area that you found and you figured out the right way to uh, take advantage of it and uh, make a living. And then sharing that experience with others gives them the opportunity as well. That was very uh, satisfying. You know, so many quote get rich books are you know, people want to get rich by next Friday, and I think I came to the marketplace with a book that really had a lot of common sense, you know, after all, I'm a banker, but, you know, this was just a niche that I found. Uh, I helped create some wealth for myself and, and create wealth for other people. That's awesome. I can really appreciate that. And, um, you know, it looks like you, you spend some time in the venture space before we dig into to your main thing these days. Um, and I appreciated that it said on your LinkedIn, where I saw this, that with Conscience VC, you're aiming to find businesses that generate a positive and scalable impact on the world by partnering with technical founders. So and it mentions pioneering the intersection of consumer and science. Um, so these things all resonate with me, you know, finding businesses that are actually making the world a better place, like you said, uh, with their actions. So, you know, I'm curious what kinds of businesses you look at um, in those endeavors, and if there's any in particular you want to mention? Well, there really aren't. You know, I dabbled in that direction a little bit because I thought it was pretty exciting, but I really kind of figured out that wasn't the right niche for me. I was better off to do what I did, and and I had the funds that could allow me to live the lifestyle I wanted to, and there's just a lot better, a lot of people that know so much more about those industries and I trust their judgment, but 
but it just wasn't a fit for me. Yeah, that completely understood. And I, it does seem like now you've found your fit as an advocate for pickleball and you're taking pickleball into prison. So, you know, I'd love to really dig into that. I know that's how um, we originally found each other. I'd learned about your work and um, I do a lot of work in criminal justice reform. And so uh, seeing what you were doing with pickleball in prisons was just really interesting to me. And, you know, before we dig specifically into your work for those that aren't attuned to one of the biggest trends around, you know, what is the background on pickleball itself? Well, I have a pretty strong background in, in the sport because I knew one of the original founders. And so I might tell, because not everybody's familiar with pickleball, even though it seems no matter where you look, there's another headline about pickleball. But let me share just a little background about how the game came, came together, because I think it's very interesting. It happened over on Bainbridge Island, which is an island just a few miles off of Seattle. And there was a guy by the name of Joel Pritchard. And Joel went later ended up being a congressman, but he's out playing golf with a buddy. They come home. The kids are bored. I want to go back to Seattle. I don't like being on the rock, all that type of thing. And so Joel says, hey, you've got a badminton court out uh, back. You guys go just go out and play some badminton. They get out there, set everything up, and they can't find the birdies. Well, about that time, what's happening is Dickie Green, age 13, is walking down the street with a wiffle ball and a plastic bat. They start hitting it over the net. And to make it easier, they drop the net. You know, the badminton rackets didn't work too well, so they grabbed some ping pong paddles, and that was the start of the game. And that was 1965. Wow. And they thought they really had a winner because everybody that played it just loved it. But what the sport was then and it is now is kind of a combination of badminton because it's on a badminton court, it's kind of like ping pong because it's really slow as far as the ball going back and forth. And many of the rules are similar to tennis. But they thought they had a winner because people loved it. Uh, Barney uh, McCallum, who was another one of the three founders, was a very good businessman. They went to the companies like Spalding, Wilson, and pitched their, their, uh, their idea. And you can appreciate this with your background, Jeff. What happened is companies looked at it and said, no money to be made. We'd rather sell tennis shoes or golf clubs so we can have a high margin. You had a $5 wooden paddle and you had a dollar ball, just no money to be made. So the sport, there were some loyal followers, but not much happened 70s, 80s, 90s, up until about 2000. You know, it was easy to play. It was easy on the joints. It was great exercise. People, most importantly, loved it, but it just didn't take off. But around 2001, 2002, baby boomers started retiring to Arizona and Florida. They discovered pickleball. They loved it. They brought the thing north. And a fascinating statistic is 2003, we known there was 39 known public places to play around the country. And now it's well over 10,000. Wow, that's incredible. So that's the kind of the short story of the background of what the sport is. Combination of, like I said, ping pong, tennis, and badminton. Yeah, no, it's, it's really interesting origin story. Just I remember making up games as a kid. So it's just, you know, crazy to think one of those could rise to, to this level of popularity and, you know, kind of over an extended period of time until it really hit. Um, and, you know, I feel like for the last few years, hear about it from everybody uh, I admittedly still have not played a game, but uh, I will. <laughs> I will at some point. I'll have sure. to get you out on the courts. You'll, <laughs> you'll love good. it like everybody else. And have you been playing it for all of these years or when did you get into it? No, I, I, I was introduced to it about a dozen years ago. And, um, I, you know, I fell in love with it just like everybody else. And coming from a professional speaking background, I said, you know, I can teach this thing very easily. And besides that, I like to tell people what to do. So I started, you know, teaching at the local health club, uh, just beginner class of here's how you play it. And the, one of the beauties on this thing is, is you can learn the game in an hour. Now, a lot of sports, you can't do that. You know, I've been trying to learn golf for 40 years. It just that it hasn't ever taken. But pick a ball, you can pick it up, be reasonably proficient, like ping pong, in an hour or so. So... A dozen years or so is when I started. 
you know, what gave you the idea that this would be a good activity to bring into prisons? Where did that start with? Did you have a background in criminal justice at all? Not, not at all. I mean, criminal justice, nothing. I had my car towed once because it was legally parked. I mean, that's the closest I came to criminal justice. All right. But my wife and I oftentimes watched 60 Minutes on Sunday evening. Uh, and what they did is they had a segment on Sheriff Tom Dart, who does his best to run Cook County Jail in Chicago. And you can imagine the challenges that that man has, because no matter what he does, he's criticized by somebody. They got about 8,000 people that fall through there every year. They got or a, a standing staff of or uh, inmates of 8,000, about 80,000 people throw the, flow through there every year. The thing is about the size of 75 football fields. It's just amazing. But we're watching this segment, and I looked at the TV set, and most of them guys are just sitting around. They're playing cards. They're playing a little bit of chess. They're talking. I said to my wife, they should be playing pickleball. They would not only benefit from exercise, but they could learn life skills like teamwork and learning from mistakes and thinking about consequences. Then I went on to say, you know what? I'm going to write Sheriff Dart a letter and tell him exactly what I think. I'll, I'll even go back there on my own dime, bring equipment and teach it to the men and women inside his jail. Well, I got one of those eye rolls. She... <laughs> My dear wife, I love her, but she says, your intentions are good, but don't be disappointed if you don't hear back from him. He's a very busy man. He gets a lot of letters. He might think that you're some kind of kook because he probably hasn't heard of pickleball. So I wrote that letter, and here's what happened. He gets it. My wife is right. Reads it. Never heard of pickleball. Sets it off to the side of his desk. But that night over dinner, I think Tom, uh, Sheriff Dart has three kids. He says, I got this letter from this guy some in Seattle, something about balls and pickles. And he wants to come back to Cook County Jail. I, I just don't know. I don't even, it doesn't make sense. Eight-year-old daughter puts her hands on her hips and says, Dad, I'll tell you about pickleball. So if it hadn't been for that daughter, none of this would have ever happened. So it wasn't long thereafter that I uh, I was on my way back to Chicago. Wow, that's that's quite the story for kind of getting in the door, and because um, it does seem like that would be a tough thing to start and, and get in those areas. But I'm glad you were able to, you know, in terms of this massive prison complex. Like, you know, to me, the whole prison industrial complex is just pretty disgusting thing that we have in our country relative to a lot of the rest of the world. And so what, you know, I think it's great that we're adding activities for people in there to have a little bit better of quality of life, but certainly, you know, I just don't want to mention prisons without getting into the fact that there's just so much work to do on the system. It's been an incredible learning experience for me. I, I had no idea what was going on and I can talk on different levels and, you know, somebody with your background, Jeff, of course, you understand so many of the different issues, but the average lay person doesn't. And, and they almost, they don't have much of an interest in it. All they want to do is be safe in their own community. But the challenges we have in this country are just overwhelming as far as what goes on inside of prisons, as you know. Yeah, it is. There's, there's a lot of work to do in there and, um, you know, but appreciate you and others that are they're bringing more opportunities there. So, so you go into Cook County, and you know, what was that first experience like? You know, what did you do uh, with the inmates, and then how has that evolved over time? Boy, and has it evolved? You know, the first thing I say is I get out of the the Uber car, and I look at this sign. It says Division Ten, Maximum Security. And I looked at that sign a week later, because I was there for a week, and I realized how much I had learned about what goes on the inside. And right up front, one of the things was how many people on the inside have mental illness problems. 
you can tell just in talking to them that they're just not quite tracking with you. And it's not really appropriate to go up to somebody and say, what are you in for? I mean, what'd you do? Um, it's maybe, I'm trying to think of an example. Maybe it's a little bit like asking somebody their age. Some people would tell you, some people would would not tell you. I mean, they, they, they feel it'd be inappropriate. But I, during that week, I was sitting on the bench with a kid while people were out playing pickleball. And I said, you, you know, I relate really well to you. You, you seem really squared away. What, you, what happened? He looked at me and he gave me an honest answer. He says, I'm bipolar. I was off my meds and I didn't mean to kill him. You have a conversation like that and you don't forget it. And how many lives were impacted because of that senseless act? To answer your question, I go inside, I go through clearance. I find myself standing in a room of 25 or so men. And I later found out that um, each person in that room was charged with either murder or attempted murder. And what I thought I'd do is just give them a little background about how this war started. It was similar to what I did with you. And it wasn't working. Arms were crossed. They're looking around the room. They never heard a pickleball. It could be tiddly winks. They were completely bored. I did not, you know, as a speaker, you know, are people with you or not? They were absolutely not with me. First thing was apparent to me was... I'm not sure anybody in that room was over 30. When I was 30, Gerald Ford was president. There was a natural disconnect there. The second thing is I live outside Seattle. I got a great family, a nice home. I know where my next meal is coming from. They're from Chicago. And the best way I can explain that is with this statistic. If four or five people are murdered with a gun, it's national headline news. And it should be, of course, because a large number of people lost their life. But if one or two people are murdered, it doesn't make the, the, the press. Well, in Chicago, Cook County, each year there's over 900 homicides. 900. That means they average more than two deaths a day. That's the world of the people that were in the room that I was addressing. Most of them, it was not a matter of if they wanted to join a gang, it's which one they, were they going to join. Because there's 57 major gangs in Chicago. They have over 100,000 members. They're almost obligated to join a gang for protection. And if you join a gang, you want to impress your friends, you want to move up the organization, you get involved in crime. Well, sooner or later, you end up in Cook County Jail. So there was a total disconnect between who I was, what I was trying to do, and who I was speaking to. You know, I thought of my wife's comment that my intentions were good. Um, I didn't know I'd be on an airplane going back to Seattle that night. Not knowing what to do, I said, all right, guys, let's go to the courts. So we went out to the courts, and I would say within 10 minutes' time, there was a 180-degree transformation. They turned into prisoners. You know, they're actually detainees because they haven't been found guilty yet, with a strut and the walk and on edge and ready to fight, they're turning into the best way I can describe it as kids on a playground. They sounded like third graders, giving each other high fives, laughing, having the time of their life. You know, I walked into that jail in the morning and I was somebody's grandpa. When I walked out at the end of the day, I was either bro or dude. So that was my first day in Chicago. Got it. Wow. It sounds like a really transformational experience. And, you know, the story you told about the the kid on the bench, 
um, you know, and, and mental illness and how that plays a role in so many people that are incarcerated. That's definitely an important point to make. You know, it's a uh, there's a lot of people inside that need to be treated with health care and compassion that haven't been yet. And um, so it really kind of I think for those people that you were saying that maybe are disinterested um, about what's going on inside jails and prisons, you know, hopefully that humanizes it a bit for them. Yeah, well, let me speak to that for just a second, because Sheriff Tom Dart is a, you know, he's a great guy and he really does his best to to help help people. But he's come out and said something like 40 percent of the people that are in my jail, maybe they should be locked up. Maybe they should be under key, but they don't belong in jail. They belong in somewhat of a mental health facility. And if you look at our population of, and I encourage people to go on the internet and you can see a chart of what's happened in the last hundred years as far as the jail population, it's just gone up like this. There's two things that really impacted that. And they both started, the first one started in about 1955 or right in that era. When we as a society said, you know, it's not right to have people under lock and key for mental problems. So we started closing down those mental places, mental health facilities. Where do those people end up? They end up in prison. And the second thing, which is really interesting if you study it, and I'm, I think you probably have, is it really started with Richard Nixon. And he declared the war on drugs. And the thought process on that is, you know, if you have bad actors in our society selling drugs, we got a drug problem, you throw them in jail or and then in prison because you take them out of society. And, and it sounds very logical and rational, all right? But it started with him, and then Reagan came along and put his stamp on the same concept. And I'm not saying it's a bad concept, but... So many of those people are on the inside are because of the drug situation. And that's why the chart is flat for so many years, up in about the 50s, and then it just takes off. Yeah, I absolutely. I appreciate you highlighting that. You know, the war on drugs is an atrocity that I've been, you know, working. It's one of many to try to remedy. And, um, you know, so much of it was, uh, th there's systemic aspects to it. And so you've got, you know, the gangs, they back hundreds of years in Chicago, as you're mentioning, people getting tied up in those. And so that's really systemic there. And then, you know, when you criminalize dr drugs, instead of treating them with health care and compassion and knowledge, um, you know, it turns into what we have today. And, you know, yes, there are th theories, you know, that may sound good on paper, but then in practice, they prove out, you know, not to work. And so, again, more of that, that we have to work on. You know, and that's that's such a great point. And and I'll, I'll throw out a, another couple of statistics. I think you find pretty fascinating. Um, and you take a country like Norway, and what they do is, if somebody goes to jail or in prison, um, ninety five percent are eventually released. But their attitude over in Norway is not so much of penalizing the person, but preparing them for once they get on the outside. They call it normalization. So instead of having cages or cells that they put people in, they put them in small rooms like you went to college, like a dormitory. And the, and the inmate actually has a key to the room. Well, in this country, what we've done is, is the thought process is much different than that. It's you did something wrong, you're going to be penalized for it. You're going to learn through that penalty, and you're not going to repeat it. Well, there's a lot of people, of course, who believe in both sides and, and both perspectives. But let me share a number that I think is pretty darn fascinating. Norway, 95% of the people are eventually released. Those that end up back in prison are about 20%. In our country... 95% of the people that are in prison are going to be released. Today's inmate is going to be tomorrow's neighbor. But as compared to the 20%, we're about 70% end up in prison in the next five years. Just a shocking statistic. You look at that and say, wow. 
yeah, these facilities aren't rehabbing people in our country, unfortunately, but, you know, hopefully it's a pathway that we can get to. And, um, you know, again, I think having what you do in some of these facilities certainly adds a lot to the experience. If you're enjoying this episode, I would greatly appreciate if you could review, like, comment, or subscribe on your favorite platforms. Your engaged support goes a long way in helping the show grow and getting our impactful guests heard. Now back to the show. You know, you talked about that first experience in Cook County. You know, how has what you do when you go into these facilities changed over that time? And, you know, what is it like today when you start with a new facility? Well, let me let me give you a little bit more background about Chicago and what happened and then some of the facilities that I've uh, visited since. And then I can bring you up to date of where I've been the last couple, three months and where I'll be next month. All right. So I've been back to Chicago three times for Cook County Jail. The last time I walked in, I couldn't believe it. You know, the guys are standing up, cheering, giving each other high fives. I felt like a rock star. And who was there that day was a a sports reporter for USA Today to write a story for the sports page. And I thought it went well. Um, You know, he interviewed me. He interviewed some of the inmates. And he called me up a couple of days later and said, Roger, um, geez, I don't know how to tell you this, but it's not going to be on the sports page. And, you know, my heart dropped. I was all excited. I told my neighbor, some of the guys at the gym, and I'm saying, oh, they're killing the story. Why are they killing the story? And then he added, he said, well, the editors read it and they've decided to put it on the front page of USA Today. And there it was. They put it on Friday, which was a day that had the most activity. And anybody that wants, of course, they can pull it up online. But I want to point out a couple things from that article that are so significant. And it's still true today. The first one is by the guy that heads up athletics. It is, um, geez, I can't remember his name right now. Anyway, Jim's a great guy. And he said, since we introduced pickleball, Disciplinary problems are are reduced. Guys want to play so much that they behave themselves. And they know if they get into trouble, they can't play pickleball. Well, I never expected that, but I say that, isn't that absolutely terrific? But even more important than that is in that article, if somebody pulls it up online, they'll see me sitting on the bench with a guy by the name of Clarence. And as that picture is taken, he's pointing out to the courts and say, Roger, look out there. Well, I look out there and I see guys playing pickleball. He says, you don't understand. He says, out there on the courts right now, you've got opposite gang members playing with and against each other. Before pickleball, they wouldn't even talk to each other. Well, that's totally amazing to me that an activity like pickleball can bring people together where they can have a conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's really powerful, and I'm sure that was rewarding to see that. Yeah. So what happened next is I ended up uh, back at Rikers Island, which is uh, the jail for New York City. Maybe you're familiar with it. Well, you would be. And that's quite a place. There's They actually have 10 sites at Rikers Island. It's right outside of Manhattan. They have a, about 100,000 people that flow through there every year, standing population of maybe 10,000 or so. I trained about 100 inmates and about 20 staff. The deputy commissioner was so impressed with pickleball when I left that he ordered pickleball equipment for all 10 sites. Came back to Washington State. I've introduced the game here to several different sites. I helped with a colleague, introduce it up in Alaska and New Hampshire, and then COVID hit. Well, you can just imagine you can just imagine what prisons are like during the height of COVID. Everybody's in a small confined area. Um, they're having horrendous staffing problems. You know, staffing's down 25%. Put yourself in the place of a warden. You know, number one, what you want to do is make sure everybody's safe. You don't want anybody getting killed. So what do you do? There's an awful lot of just just locking them in lockdowns of, of walking them in their cells. Obviously, I couldn't do that. So 
I kind of shifted gears by say, well, I have enough information here. I'm going to start speaking to different groups on exactly what we're talking about. Pick a ball, the past, where it is today, where it's going, but especially what's happening in prisons. I agreed to give one speech and that quickly ballooned to over a dozen. Recently, what's happened, of course, is prisons are opening up. COVID, I don't know if it's gone, but it's certainly on the decline and we're getting things back to quote more normal. I, I was asked around Christmas time if I would go to Florida. The Department of Corrections reached out to me and they said, um, would you come down here and introduce the game to some of our prisoners? I agreed. I was down there for eight days and visited a number of sites. Everybody loved it. I mean, I'm so used to everybody loving it. But as one of the inmates said to me, he said, Roger, it's popular on the outside from what I understand. I'm glad they enjoy it. But inside, we need it. We really need it. We got a, a letter back from the head of education for the Department of Corrections. He said, your pilot program was a massive success. The impact that you're going to have on the Florida Department of Corrections is practically immeasurable. They're fast tracking the, the sport right now. They have about 50 different sites in Florida. They're fast tracking it to many of the sites in the state. And soon thousands, if not tens of thousands of inmates will be playing the game. Wow, that's that's remarkable. And it's um, just the, you know, the effort that you went into to get this game into these areas is going to impact so many lives. And I just think that's tremendous and exciting. And, you know, glad you came in touch with pickleball. Well, thank you. And it's growing organically before I tell you what I'm doing right now. I, you know, I, I would, this morning I was on a phone call with a woman from Missouri that wants to introduce it in her state. Uh, I talked to somebody recently from St. Louis who wants to do the same thing. Last month, I talked to a woman from Virginia, and she said, Roger, let me tell you my story. She said, years ago, I was a teacher's aide for a second grade class. And there was this eight-year-old child in there, this little girl that had real issues, anger issues. She had no friends. She was wetting her pants in the classroom. As a teacher's aide, I reached out to her and I wanted to help her, but she absolutely wouldn't let me into her life at all. But I persisted. And over time, we developed a little bit of a relationship. I found out she never knew her dad and her mother was in prison. The prison was only about 30 miles away. So I said to her, let's go visit your mom. She wouldn't have anything at all to do with it. But Mary, the woman that I'm talking about, persisted. Finally, the two of them went to the prison. They went through the gates. They saw each other. They ran up, embraced. They hugged and cried and cried and cried. Mary tells me, she says, you know, I don't know what happened to that little girl. That was many years ago, but I think of her often. I started playing pickleball. I love it. And I want to go back to that prison and teach those women pickleball. Will you help me? So, of course, Jeff, I said yes, and it will happen. It's going to happen real soon. That's awesome. It's uh, it's nice to see what, you know, uh, relatively sort of innocent looking activity can, you know, do to other people's lives and how much it can, can impact them. And, um, you know, I appreciate you sort of having the courage to go through that you know, process to get this going. And, you know, I know you've you mentioned you've been at Rikers Island and Cook County. And um, I know at Corcoran, the largest prison in California, you know, do you have any further thoughts on just the prison system as a whole and what you've seen? Yeah, you know, I have a lot of thoughts and it kind of goes into maybe what I'm doing right now. And I was sitting at my desk 
five, six weeks ago, and I get an email, and it's from the warden at San Quentin who asked for um, a video call, which we had the following day. I got on with a couple of his lieutenants, the warden, and myself, <clears throat> and I thought I'd start out by saying, warden, let me tell you about some of the benefits of pickleball on the inside for inmates. And he goes, Roger, I've done my research. How soon can you be here? The answer, Jeff, is May 5th. Then what happened is Folsom found out about it, and I'll be there. So they want me, and I'll be there May 3rd. And May 4th, I'm going out to two other prisons in the, in the area. Now, a little background on San Quentin, and there was just an article written, or an opinion piece in the New York Times by Bill Keller, and I think he was a former executive um, editor. And he got involved in the Marshall Project, and he talks about San Quentin and Governor uh, Newsom and what they're trying to accomplish. And in that piece, he says they're trying to convert San Quentin, which has more people on death row than any other prison in the Western Hemisphere, over to more of a Norwegian-style prison system. They're trying to adapt people from the punishment aspect to making them fit into society once they get out. And that's indirectly how and why the, the warden called me because he sees the pickleball as a piece of the, of the puzzle. Well, I'm, I'm really glad to hear that they're trying to move in that direction and um, that you get to, to be part of that transformation. Well, it's really, really exciting for me. And um, yeah, because once you... Once you get involved in the subject matter and you go deep enough to understand it, then what you do is you realize some of the problems we have in this country of how it's working or not working and how to make it better. So, you know, you've gone into to all of these prisons. There's more pulling you in, um, which is amazing. You know, what do you envision sort for the future of this program? You know, do you imagine having other ambassadors for the sport? You know, what is your... You're thinking there. Well, I'm committed to spreading the word. You know, the there's no doubt that with or without me, that pickleball is going to expand inside prisons because it helps so much. At the same time, it's inexpensive equipment. I mean, it everybody can play it. The mo most popular pr sport on the inside is basketball because a lot of these kids grew up playing it on the streets. But we also know that that's dominated by the young, the tall, the athletic, and everybody else sits on the sidelines. But pickleball is a game that everybody can play, and it is going to spread. It's spreading organically, just like the, the examples I gave you before. I, I'll, I'm i probably going to move more into a management role of getting giving guidance, like the people I talked about. I'm probably also going to do more of reaching out to governors around the country and say, I'll come back there on my own dime and either teach pickleball to the right people or give a presentation about what I do. There's a, what gave me the idea for that is there's a, a business group, a leadership group in Seattle, and it's been around for 80, 90 years. And some of their speakers were Bill Gates, Nelson Mandela, Governor Inslee, Oprah Winfrey, um, John McCain, and they asked me to speak on pickleball. And if anybody has an interest in it, they can pull it up online because it's under uh, it's under YouTube. And I think the title they call it uh, "Pickleball Past, Present, and Prisons." And during the question and answer, the gentleman raises his hand, stands up, and he says, "I've been a member of this club for 44 years." Roger, you just gave one of the best presentations I've ever heard. So there's an audience out there that really appreciates what insights I can share about what prison life is like and how we can make it better and the role that the pickleball can play in that. But also by addressing an audience, what I do is I'm really saying to people, well, what about you? Maybe this is something that you should take a look at. You know, 
A lot of people say, well, I can't do that because, you know, I'm too old or whatever. And one of the slides I have is my friend Bob. Bob's 93. And he does just fine on the pickleball court at 93. I asked, I asked him recently, I said, Bob, does pickleball keep you young? He says, not really, Roger. What keeps me young is my 72-year-old wife. <laughs> That's great. So, so I'm delivering doing a couple of messages. I'm talking about the prisons, but I'm also talking about this sport, which I talked to a reporter from the Boston Globe, was it last year? And he says, my research shows that pickleball is the fastest growing sport in the history of America. That was the headline you know, that they ran with a couple of days later. Yeah, it's pretty astounding. And um, I have certainly seen that being the case. And I've heard some of those stats and um, definitely been thinking that, you know, I got to try it out. Everybody loves it. But uh Glad to hear that it's growing, and um, hopefully it'll have positive effects on uh, all the people that get interested in it. Well, people just love it. So, you know, you've talked about some of the people you've met in these prisons and some of the, the stories um, around the people that you've met as well. Have there been any other stories that were particularly, you know, interesting, like that really brought brought you to realize how much help you'd brought to someone? Well, I can think a couple of things off the top of my head. One is um, it was uh, an officer in one of the prisons. I can't remember right now which one it was. And he said something like, um, Roger, you're not going to remember the, the, the guys in this room, but I'll guarantee you some of them will never forget you. And of course, that's a real touching comment to receive. Another thought that comes to my mind is when I was in Chicago, and as you know, Jeff, inside a gymnasium in prison is very noisy. I mean, there's all hard surfaces. You almost have to shout to be heard. It's real similar to like a college football game where everybody gathers real close around the coach uh, before the game just, just to try to hear him. So I'm teaching the game, and there was this one guy – I think he's, he was. He looks like he was, you know, Eastern European, and a huge man of 320 pounds or so. And he comes over and he screams something in my ear, and about one of the rules. What happens if it hits the line or something like that? And I scream back at him. A couple of minutes later, he's back over and he got another question, and I scream back the answer to him. And then about five minutes later, an officer comes up and he says, "Excuse me, Roger, was that guy talking to you?" Well, I didn't, of course he was talking to me. I mean, what kind of question is that? And I said, well, you know, that's polite. I said, well, yes, he was, of course. He says, he's been here for two months and he hasn't said one single word to anybody. We didn't know he could talk. Pickleball can break down barriers. That, that's a great, great example that definitely shows that. And, um, you know, thank you for all the efforts that you've gone through to, to bring it to more people and um, especially in prisons and, I'm excited to see how that evolves and uh, hopefully we get to a place where, you know, most prisons have that among many other offerings for individuals in need of, of rehab and uh, planning to inter reintegrate into society. I think that's very well said. And there's few, there's some people out there that, that kind of understand and in my, from my viewpoint, we're moving in the right direction. But of course, there's an awful lot of people that maybe they're dealing on an emotional level without having a lot of information, but they just kind of say, lock them up. They'll learn, just lock them up. Right. But today's, as I said earlier, today's inmate is going to be tomorrow's neighbor. And what type of person do we want going back into society? And when you look at a statistic that says 70 to 75% ends up back inside the wire, and we're not doing a very good job as a society. Agreed. Um, certainly plenty of, of things to do on, on that front. And um, I'll continue to, to host a lot of people working in drug policy and criminal justice reform on the podcast. And we'll learn more about other uh, work that's going on to improve the criminal justice system. Um, but in the meantime, this is the point in the podcast where if you'd like, you can ask me a question. 
Jeez, uh, you now that's the hardest question you asked me today. Uh, no, you know, I did a little background on on you, and it's very impressive. I don't know how you find enough hours in the day to do what you do uh, with all the businesses you're involved with, as well as doing the podcast. And I think I'm particularly impressed with the podcast because you know you're you're taking different people that are doing something to make a difference, and that's just wonderful. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. And yeah, I mean, I, I tend to spread myself thin uh, between business philanthropy and fatherhood, but it keeps life interesting to do for me to do a lot of different things. And um, yeah, maybe we'll get some more more hours in the day one of these days. But, um, you know, I'm just I've mentioned it before on here, but I'm just passionate about all the positivity in the world and all the great things that people are doing, because for every negative story the media focuses on, I think there are multiple stories of people that are working to make the world a better place, whether it's in the life of one individual that someone's improving or whether it's something more widespread, like putting pickleball in prisons. Okay. Well, that's why you're a success there, Jeff. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. And uh, I have this, this one big question that I ask every guest. If you could snap your fingers and fix one thing in the world, what would it be? And how do you think that change would reverberate? I would like to reduce negativity. I think that we're so driven by negativity in our society. And part of that is a quote by um, Teddy Roosevelt that says, comparison is a thief of joy. And I think they go kind of hand in hand because what we do is we compare our insides to other people's outside and we're always looking for more. And you take those negative aspects and as well as that comparison that I just mentioned is if we could reduce that, it would make the world a better place. I agree wholeheartedly and hope that we're getting closer to living in such a world and, um, you know, really enjoyed talking about talking to you, learning about your work. Um, for people listening, you know, how can they support you and your impact? Well, what I'd like to do is give my email address where if anybody has any questions that they can reach out to me, either about the game or about the game in prisons. And if that's okay with you, I'll give it right now, which is B E L A I R R at Gmail. So that's Bel Air with an extra R on the end for Roger. And Drop me an email and I'll get back to you with an answer. Great. Yeah, no, we really appreciate you sharing that. I'll share it in the notes as well. And um, you know, just thanks again so much for your time. I'm excited for you to continue to, to grow your program and um, to get it into more prisons and uh, beyond. So, you know, I look forward to keeping in touch. Awesome. Well, yeah, let's stay in touch, Jeff. Thanks for listening to this episode of People Are The Answer. If you enjoyed the episode, share it with friends and reviews or subscriptions on your favorite platforms go a long way to help the show grow. I want to share these incredible people and their remarkable work with as many others as possible. Thanks for your support. For more, go to peoplearetheanswer.com.